I'm Susan Williams with the Social Sciences Department here at GRCC, and today we are very lucky to have our diversity talk with Michael Twitty, blogger, soon to be author of a fabulous bestseller, uh, you know, and, and somebody who, who does really great work with things that, like, I was talking to my students about you today, and I was explaining, like, what culinary justice is, and what food pathways were, and all of a sudden, all these students are like, what time is this talk? And it was, <laughs> it was nice to see them thinking about history as a historian, right? Thinking about history wow. in a way that was really accessible to them, that made them feel kind of empowered, and they thought maybe in a different way about it. So I'm really excited to talk to you today, because I think we're, we're in for a treat tonight. So. Fantastic. So I was going to, um, I was thinking today about good questions to ask during our conversation and everything else, but one of the things that I, I'm, you are my choice for this, this year's diversity lecture talk. I mean, I was, I'm a big fan of your blog and have been a fan for years now of, of your writing and your voice. You're very passionate about food and history and belonging and ancestry and all of these really cool things. And you're just so eloquent in your blog, I think. And, and what I really, what really drew me to your blog was the fact that you try to to be kind of a moderate voice, I think, a lot of the times in, in conversations about race and food and history. Um, you really see yourself as somebody who's an advocate for peace and reconciliation. Yes. And I am really passionate about that as well. Could you tell us how you got started and how you got passionate about this field in particular? Um, I think a lot of it is owed to my family. my um, And that's sort of in a passive way. You know, no one's grandparents who were poor or oppressed or had hard times. They don't want to talk about hard times. They don't want to talk about the successes. I really want to know about those hard times because I thought there was something of value in them, namely survival. You know, I often tell my audiences how people who are in dire circumstances survive is an incredible source of power. It is one of their greatest strengths. So for me, you know, Always, it was my grandmother's official taster. So that's how I got involved in the kitchen and food. But um, it, go, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that. I always felt a connection to these people who had been long gone, who were enslaved, who were emancipated. And I loved hearing what little bits and pieces of their story I could find. And as I started to grow up and experience real prejudice and real racial hatred um, in my own life, which was scary and demeaning, um, I realized that the things that I was really interested in, sort of like these stories, these narratives of overcoming and empowering oneself were really didactic. They weren't just some, a nice story. They were something that were important to me. And I felt like everybody else needed that story too. Um, I don't really feel that the fight can continue much longer. The struggle between I am us versus them, I am right and you are wrong. Um, our way is the only way and there's no other way. Uh, I really feel that's just self-destruction. So for me, um, I didn't want to take a path that made people feel alienated. Um, and I also had to understand and break down my own blackness which as a person in North America is intimately tied to other people's whiteness. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and their brownness and their otherness. So I really wanted to make sure that people um, got the message that, you know, pursuing this kind of path of peace, working together, and admitting to yourself that you will not always see eye to eye, that you will not always agree, that it's not a kumbaya moment, it is a connection moment, um, is really what I'm all about. Oh, I think that's wonderful. What would you, you do a lot of cooking demonstrations um, and you teach people about the life. I just saw on your blog recently, you did a big demonstrations and you went to a, a huge conference around these issues in particular. What do you think is important about connecting to people in the kitchen? over mm. maybe giving, like you're gonna give us a talk tonight. Right. What do you see as like the, the difference between those two kinds of formats, giving a talk versus cooking and talking around that food? You know, giving a talk, people, you ask people to open their ears. When you cook, you ask people to open their mouths and their hearts. Inevitably, when people see you cook, especially when I cook on a plantation, which for a lot of people is a place fraught with all sorts of meaning, good and bad. 
So you go to this space or you go to a modern kitchen even, you do like a cooking demo and you get, pe- you know, you draw people out of the audience and get them involved. And all of a sudden they start to testify. Little kids testify about what they, foods they like. Elders testify about things they remember or say things like my grandmother, my grandfather, my father, my mother. All of a sudden you're bringing these people back to life for them. And then you see, you know, parents and children, adults, you know, and youth, multi-generations sort of, you know, relate to each other. One time I was at a, a demo I did at Colonial Williamsburg, and I was talking about the hot sauce on the table. And, you know, for a lot of African Americans, these kind of like basic everyday moments are not ennobled. They just considered whatever. But when I talked about you know, how the hot sauce started and the recipes and the peppers and the whole history behind it and how, you know, it was always on the table and always part of our tradition. This young man, African-American, 1415, nudges his dad with a big smile. And he says, just like grandma, you know? And so he, you know, he knows like the table when he goes to his family's home place, probably in North Carolina somewhere, that that's always there and there's a reason for it. And so they have people's light bulbs go off. In both spaces, light bulbs are going off. But, you know, um, I've been fortunate to have audiences that mostly connect with me and the light bulb goes off and they want to have these deep conversations afterwards, which I always entertain. It could take me into an hour and a half after the presentation. But especially if they're younger people, like college age people or high schoolers, um, even middle schoolers, rarely, but um, I think that conversation is important for them to have because they may not have it anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's that's critical. Um, there's only been one time when I felt like I didn't make the connection, and it was unfortunately in Mississippi. And I felt that I went in there gung ho, and I went in there with my WP narratives from, you know. The collections were, that were recorded from enslaved, formerly enslaved people during the Depression, in word blazing in those narratives. And I, afterwards, you know, I got my applause at the end, but I got not one single question from a student. The room was packed. A lot of classes were required to attend. And then I thought about it, and I broke it down in my head, and I said, you are on an American campus in the Deep South at one of the most contested academic spaces in the history of this country. And you were talking to two separate and distinct groups of people. And they do not want to engage in this conversation openly. And that was, you know, that woke me up because I did not succeed in my mission. In fact, um, being the person that I am, being really confrontational about some things, but in a, in, a, in a safe way, wasn't good enough for that space. So I'm very conscious of the fact that every time I go to a, to a new audience, whether it's doing a demo or doing a lecture, that they're, they're bringing certain energies to the room. They're bringing certain realities and experiences to the room. And I have to be aware of those and respect them before I open my mouth. Yeah, that's a really good way to look. I think for anybody, you know, not just Mm -hmm. you and what you do, but teachers as well. And sometimes we deal with incredibly difficult subject matter and you do, you have two different classes and sometimes it's that makeup and it's that energy of the room Mm -hmm. and it's whether they want to open their ears, which is a conscious decision to open yourself up to what somebody has to say and be humble right. and listen to someone and not, I always tell my students, it's not about empathy because right. empathy, it's all about, well, do I do, is that person like me? Whereas right. humility is I'm going to open my ears and I'm going to listen to what somebody has to say. And it's not about me saying, am I like this person, but rather I'm ready and willing to listen to them and engage with them and learn something new, right. regardless of whether I feel like that, that changes me or it changes my perspective. Perspective, you know, it just is. It just is. And sometimes there's an empowerment in learning how to listen as a humble person, I think, mm. that you're, you just are. And you, you know, and that, that is a story. And that's somebody's story. And you, it's not for you to accept or not accept. Right. But it's for you to hear and attempt to understand as much as you can. And, you know, I think that that, that can be very empowering at times. I was going to ask you, I'm really curious. If you had to make a meal 
to tell your story, what you would want. Mm. Let's say that you're having a dinner party for people that you want to teach about what you're passionate about. What would that meal be? Oh, wow. Um, so I think I would start with pot liquor. Yeah. The, you know, the liquid that you get from ball and greens and pole beans, et cetera. Um, that was my first food after, you know, cow milk and mom milk. It was like, you know, and cornbread, which is, you know, really kind of, you know, weird, exciting and great at the same point in time, because that was actually the baby food of enslaved children. As the more and more I did my research, and I was like, wow, there's a tradition here going on. There's something very deep about that. And then it would be pizza. <laughs> you know, uh, the idea that when I was a little kid, I went from kind of being open to being very um, much a part of the industrial food system, very much a part of, you know, fast food, very much a part of when you look at commercials and look at ads, the food looks perfect and pure and idealistic. It's like that platonic, you know, cave with the shadows, you know, you know there's this <laughs> the platonic idea. Yeah, it's like <laughs> the idea of what it should be. And that's what you should be like. And anything else is is horrible or, you know, it's not the real thing. And that's how I looked at the food in my own family. Um, and then I sort of came around a little bit and then little bit by little bit, recipe by recipe, experience by experience, I began to incorporate the sort of more traditional vegetable dishes of soul food. And that became, it was a big, big deal because then I was learning the stories. But also I grew up in a multicultural community. So when we had our 20 year reunion um, a couple months ago, looking around that room of Korean and Salvadorian and African American and Haitian and West African and Italian American and Middle Eastern and Indian subcontinent faces. And knowing that, you know, everybody doesn't grow up that way. You know, we everybody doesn't grow up with kimchi and samosa and, um, you know, skunjili and other things being readily available. You know, just you, most people don't roll up to someone's house and have kibbe. You know, it's but that's how we grew up. We grew up swapping our weird ethnic foods at lunch, and we grew up going to each other's houses and hanging out. And inevitably, we still lived in a time where there were the grandmothers, you know, the grandmothers who had made that journey. And that's something I realized with my own students. I'm like, wow, they don't know anybody who got on a boat. They don't know anybody who turned their back before the age of television and immigrated to a new country, or had an accent, or had stories about, you know, a world that seems you know, 150 years ago and a million miles away. They don't have that. We did. You know, I had people who came, to, you know, from immigrated because of the Holocaust and before that, people who came from Iran before the Shah. I mean, I had that. So those stories, you know, became part of my narrative too and made me that much more open. Um, and then as I've grown, you know, it's been exciting to be a part of um, the food world now, you know, going and being exposed to molecular gastronomy and being exposed to, you know, um, raw foods and veganism and all this other good stuff. So I guess in some ways that meal would reflect not only the journey of my own life, but the journey that our food has taken from, you know, simple agrarian to industrial to ethnic appreciation to experimenting with good food in ways that seem modern and um, contemporary and weird and fun. So, yeah. What would be for dessert? Oh, my God. Well, Because that's the thing I'm stuck on. Well, that, apple like. crisp, of course. <laughs> that was my, you know, or caramel cake or custard, egg custard pie. Those were, the, those were some of the big three that my mother was ex especially good at making and my grandmother before her. And so now I have the, the task of doing those desserts. Um, but every time, they come out just so. And it's like these little prayers, please help me with this recipe, you know, with this thing. Um, you know, knowing that those were the things that were, get, you know, those were birthday treats, mm -hmm. you know. It wasn't, I didn't, I didn't want Baskin Robbins. I wanted my mother's caramel cake. I wanted the apple crisp, you know. And then the greatest joy of my life was when my mom was passed away um, a couple years, the year last year. Um, before she, Thanksgiving before she passed away, I made this mega apple crisp. I'm looking to go out all out. 
And I had no clue that my mom was not going to be there anymore. But I said, okay, we're going to do this. So I had the real vanilla beans, mm -hmm. and I got apples from Wisconsin and Virginia, and they were like 10 different varieties of apples you'd never get in the store. Mm -hmm. And I mixed them all up, and I had raw sugar, and I had the vanilla bean scrapings, and I, and I did heavy cream, and my mom said, that's the best apple crisp I ever had. Success, right? You didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> that was, you know, so that was, that to me was like the degree that said, okay, you're, you're doing the tradition. You can, you can go on. You made me proud. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, my parents grew, you know, my, my dad's from Eastern Ohio, but my mom and my, her whole family is from Appalachia. Mm -hmm. When we grew up, like, we didn't want any of that food. We wanted, you know, box spaghetti, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stuff that would have the herb mix you'd put with tomato paste and yep. stuff. And because, you know, that was real food to us. Right. And um, that was modern. And, um, you know, we, we did, it's amazing to me how much we didn't respect all the work that went into the foods and, oh, we didn't want shuck beans. Oh, goodness. Oh, good God, the dried ones, yes. you know, that you dry out in your basement and they kind of smell musty yes. after a while. And now it's like, now that my grandmother's gone and my mom's gone, there are days that I'm like, you know, it sounds real good right now. Mm -hmm. Like shuck beans, but nobody around here even grows them. And, you know, up here I complain all the time about how, like, you know, you know, be real nice right now, a biscuit. But Lord <laughs> knows people in Michigan do not know how to make biscuits, right? And no matter how much they say it's exactly like it, I'm like, I don't care what you have to say nope. unless your grandma made it. Right. Uh, and you learn from her, you don't know how to make biscuits, That's particularly right. southern biscuits, you know? So it's amazing sometimes how much you lose an opportunity too. They, mm -hmm. you know, that there's things when you grow up and that's not modern and that's Southern. And you know, that was like poor people food. And that's right. how, when we were kids, we wanted to be modern kids uh, who and ate all this box wasn't stuff. The same. Oh, it's horrible. Your palate wasn't the same. Your palate wanted simple, basic, neutral. And a lot of times these foods are not, yeah. they are musty, they yeah. are vinegary, they are strong, they it's are spicy. Lot. Yeah. Complicated. Yeah. And like it, the identity. And it doesn't feel complicated. Right. When, when you make it and you realize like how few ingredients actually sometimes go into it, but it's such a big taste. But it's, you're right. I mean, it is a strong and it's an old taste. It's mm. not a modern taste. It's it's right. the past that you're tasting with that vinegar. Uh, and there's days even now that I'll make something and be like, Phew, this is a little bit too much for today. That's a little bit too much of the past for today, right? <laughs> um, I was going to ask you, what do you think, thinking about food pathways and food history in the U.S., what would you like everybody to know? Like, if you had to boil mm. down some information for people. Like, one of the things I loved when I discovered your blog, it was about Southern cooking. It was about Paula Deen, and, you know, I thought that you were the only elegant response to that entire thing where you didn't want to light people on fire, but you wanted to have a conversation and start a conversation that was really complex and was a lot bigger than one person and horrible choices that one person made, right. but rather something bigger about the entire industry and the entire way that people talked about food and Southern food and its history. And I thought it was so interesting how you talked about the uniqueness of African-American cuisine and how it's just a marker of the American experience. Uh, which, so could you tell us, like, what would you take out and want everybody to know about, right. or some things, I guess, not everything, but okay. some things. So the first thing is that authenticity is really people boxing in what can't be boxed in. People, use that, they throw that word around, authentic, mm -hmm. and authentic, you know authenticity, throw them around very irresponsibly. And it's supposed to be some kind of marker, some kind of test of what is real and what is really not in food or anything else with identity. And it's really just, you know, arbitrary boxes that we put each other in and each other's material culture in to sort of, you know, weed through and say, this is real, this is not. Well, the reality is it's all real. It's all human experience. No two things are gonna be the same. So you can't say that something's authentic or not authentic. That's one. Two, Americanization and the process of diffusion is not a watering down. It's a morphing. 
um, to say that Chinese American or Italian American or African American food is somehow uh, bastardized or lost something in translation um, is really not accurate. It did change, and sometimes it changed for the the better, and sometimes for the worse. But that change must be respected, because that change is part of a process. You know, much like the human body goes through changes from birth to death, much like you know seasons change, food and food culture does too. So you have to respect that. You can't just throw it, you know throw everything away. Um, I see that a lot. It, it bugs me. Um, another thing is that. Diffusion and appropriation are not the same thing. I talk a lot about appropriation. I hate appropriation. Can but you give an example? Yes. Um, I, I think culinary appropriation involves the exploitation of another people's food tradition or even using it against them or taking advantage of systemic um, empowerments that are not given to other people and, you know, marketing the food and marketing the culture and marketing the story when the people who actually created it don't have that access, cannot empower themselves that way. And you have to ask the question, why? So why is this rice produced by enslaved people in the Carolina Low Country, the centerpiece of boutique Southern cuisine, but none of those people who still live in the the Low Country, the Sea Islands, can afford to buy that rice that ancestors grew and in fact taught their slaveholders how to grow um, and build a whole cuisine around it, right? That fused African, European, Native American and other food ways together to make this a great uh, tradition within Southern cooking. So you have to ask that question. And it's not just black people. It's around the world. It's Irish versus English. It's Japanese and Korean. It's anywhere where there's conflict, kind of Greek and Turkish. It's there, the sort of push-pull between who owns this, who doesn't own it and why. Who, who claims this? You know, when the Turks had the Ottoman Empire, they claimed it was all theirs. But now Greeks say, this is ours. And we don't think of, we forget about that big Ottoman Empire that owned everything in that part of the world. And so there's this push-pull between who is right, who is on the right side of power, who's on the wrong side of power. Um, but diffusion is a natural process. Diffusion is going to happen anytime cultures come to contact with each other. Diffusion is going to happen anytime that we are neighbors with one, with one another. You know, exploitation is a choice. So to me, those two different realities have to be separate. And there's, you know, one more little point when we look at food. You have to remember something. All food comes with human stories. All food comes with human stories. Not one of them is without a human narrative. I think that's amazing. You were, when you were talking about the Ottoman Empire, I had to start laughing because I lived in Romania for a year. Hmm. And I traveled around the Balkans and thinking about Ottoman, I was thinking exactly that before you said the Ottomans. You go to one restaurant and you'd have some stuffed cabbage. And right. you'd be like, okay, I know what this is called in Romania. And then you'd go to Bosnia and you would have the exact mm -hmm. same dish, have a little bit of a different name. And you'd be like, oh, I had this in Romania. It's amazing. And you, I recognize as a historian, this is Ottoman. I mean, these are Ottoman mm -hmm. traditions and Mediterranean spice palettes. But you would have a, a, you know, a conversation with the owner of the restaurant. They'd be like, no. Not the same at all as the Romanian dish. We invented this. Right. Uh, and then you'd go to the next country. You'd go to Bulgaria. Same exact it's dish. It's Bulgarian. Same exact spice palette. Mm -hmm. And they were very, and that, that people are deeply passionate about that. I learned very quickly not to argue at but that point. Because it doesn't matter to argue. You accept right. that this is to them something very special and very important. And it says something about their people, right? And their culture. It also says, it also says to us that it's very interesting how when people of African descent make the same arguments, they're usually shot down. Yeah. You know, nobody would dare cross a Bulgarian restaurant owner or, you know, grandmama, a babushka, you know, with that. That's probably a smart thing not to get Right, not to. <laughs> but they'll, they'll cross us all the time and say, oh, that's European. You got that from us. We taught you. You know, I, that's another part of culinary injustice that we have to be aware of, that some people have the rights, like the Turks and the Greeks, going back to that little discussion. You know, when the Turks had the power, it was all in their hands. But when the Greeks joined Western, got back with Western civilization, they got back with Western civilization at a time when Europe was colonizing the world mm -hmm. and white supremacy ruled the world. 
So now they're all Greek foods. Mm-hmm. Interesting. When the Greeks are also the ancestors of this great experiment in European domination. So the narrative changed. So um, in the same way we look at Southern food in that way of who has the power? Well, ultimately the power belongs to the people who make you rich, who can choose to resist you, who can choose to not agree with your power structure. Uh, so we have to ask those new questions. But even then, you know, is, is cornbread Appalachian? Is it African-American? Is it Native American? Is it Mexican-American? What is it? It's all the above. It's all the above. Because it has different meanings and complexities to whoever put their hands on the recipe. That's why. Well, thank you so much. This was such a great conversation. I was, I feel like I know you really well after reading your blog for as long as I have, so I, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you face to face. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoy being here, and um, I'm glad that people are getting sort of like the word and having the conversation among themselves. If I did that, then it's successful. And we're kind of you know, opening to those hearts and minds to so the new reality. And it's all based on what we experience here at the table. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.